Neil, the concept of self-organization is one of those new phenomena in scientific thinking that pervades a lot of fields. Mm -hmm. I've talked to physicists, city planners, mathematicians, yeah. but not a biologist, yeah. especially yeah. not a liver pathologist. How do you see in your world self-organization working? The concept of self-organization wasn't anything I was ever thinking about. It was not a phrase that I was familiar with, and it wasn't a concept I was juggling. As a liver pathologist, I'm looking at tissues, at the human tissues, at the microscopic level sure. all the time. And through doing that, I started to figure out back in 1996 that the liver actually had stem cells. And now everyone thinks every organ has stem cells. It's sort of common knowledge. Uh, 15 years ago, not so much. The blood had stem cells, the bone marrow had stem cells, the skin, the GI tract, certainly not the brain, the heart probably not, liver probably not. But it turned out that was wrong, and I could see where the stem cells were and how they were functioning in certain forms of liver disease, particularly post-liver transplant. That explained some of the experimental data that was sort of, are there stem cells or not in the liver, in mouse experiments, rat experiments, but not all of the data. And that led me to the question of whether cells could also be coming from outside the liver. So um, I worked with a woman at, uh, named Diane Krauss at Yale. I went on sabbatical there to originally to isolate stem cells from the liver. And what we wound up doing is bone marrow transplants from male mice into female mice. And that meant the male cells had Y chromosomes in them. The female mouse had no Y chromosomes. So if after the bone marrow transplant, all the blood had Y chromosomes like you'd expect. And when we looked at the liver tissue under the microscope, sure enough, there were Y chromosomes in liver cells. So we had shown, um, as had one other group at the time, that cells from the bone marrow could transit to the liver and become liver. Um, other groups were starting to show bone marrow to heart, brain stem cells could turn into blood, um, and then we published a paper in May of 2001 which sort of sparked the, the full flourishing of the big stem cell debates. We took a single cell, um, transplanted from uh, the bone marrow of a male mouse into a female mouse. This was done with Saul Sharkis down at Johns Hopkins who could do one cell transplant experiments. It's not easy to do. And we found cells from that one bone marrow cell throughout the blood, the spleen, the liver, the GI tract, the skin. Um, basically, all the tissues derived from all three layers of the embryo. So we had shown that a single adult cell could do everything an embryonic stem cell could do. And a few weeks later, George Bush was addressing the nation about embryonic stem cells. So, so that was my flurry of activity. Um, I was put in touch with an artist named Jane Prophet. Uh, in the UK, who had been doing artificial life uh, artwork. Uh, oh, she developed a world called Technosphere. And unexpectedly for her, she would have people create um, virtual creatures that would go into the world of Technosphere, and they would send little postcards back about their activities. They didn't program high-level behaviors in these animals. What they did... Um, was just, you know, they would wander around, they would eat, they would copulate, carnivores would eat the herbivores, <laughs> herbivores would run from the carnivores, you know, things like that. When they got to several thousand creatures that people had put into the world, they noticed things that they hadn't programmed. So, for example, suddenly the population would become very stable, and then there would be a population crash. And they didn't know what was going on because they hadn't programmed anything like that. It turned out the herbivores had started to self-organize into herds, and they would eat their way into a closed valley, and the carnivores would line up at the mouth of the valley and wait. And when the herbivores ate all the food in the valley and tried to leave, <coughs> population crash. So Jane and I were telling each other, as part of an interdisciplinary experiment, what we do. And one of the complaints about the adult stem cell work was that um, yeah, we had shown that the bone marrow cells went to liver, to lung, you know, wherever. But in most tissues where there wasn't a lot of injury, it was one in a thousand cells, one in ten thousand cells. So people said, well, yeah, it happens, fine, we'll give you that, but it's trivial. It doesn't really have any import. Um, we had examples where it was significantly higher, so that critique didn't really hold, but that didn't, two examples 
um, didn't really answer the, the mechanistic question of why that low level? Why one in a thousand cells? Why would that be important for the organism? It turns out what Jane was pointing me to, she noticed a link here. Um, Self-organizing systems, also known as complex systems, um, describe groups of interacting individuals that if they fulfill certain criteria, they will self-organize into larger scale structures, the way birds will assemble into a flock, the way humans will create neighborhoods and cities. Um, and those criteria relate to how many there are. So an ant colony, three ants don't make a colony, 25 will, but 250 will make a more complex colony, a thousand ants will make a still more complex colony. Um, there have to be w ways in which they interact with each other so that there are like thermostatic controls on the system, so things don't get too far out of balance. Negative homeostatic feedback loops, they're called. Um, no individual in the group is monitoring what's going on at the whole. The flock of birds isn't paying attention to the shape of the flock. The ants, each individual ant, isn't thinking, is there enough food in the colony? They're just doing what they do at the local level. And there's got to be low-level randomness in the system. If there's too much randomness, then you can't get any self-organization. You just get disorder. But without any randomness in the system, it will always self-organize exactly the same way. Mm. And if the environment changes, then it can't adapt and it's going to die. So low-level randomness is key. And Jane said to me, this is what happened in Technosphere. There was low-level randomness in the programming. And that allowed things to start self-organizing into adaptive living social structures amongst these virtual creatures. And she pointed to the idea that maybe this low-level bone marrow cell to liver ah. was the quench disorder in the system. Mm -hmm. And so we started exploring. We had a series of papers, and then we formed a, a little bit of a larger group called the Cell Team, um, where we explored this with an A-Life programmer and a, a mathematician, um, to look at cells like ants. And cells self-organize, because they fulfill all the same criteria as the ants do, as the virtual creatures in Technosphere did, as you and I do when we're walking in crowds in the city. Um, that. The way cells interact with each other creates embryologic, fetal, postnatal development into adulthood. And that's how our tissues and our organs form. Hmm. And there are implications to that. Um, in the mathematics of complex systems, um, the mathematical zone for complexity is between fractal chaos, on the one hand, and perfect order. And as you move from the perfect order zone into fractal chaos, mathematically, it's at that border, at the edge of chaos, that you get self-organization and living adaptive structures. You might think you could plot a given complex system as a single point in that zone. You could locate it. But because of the limited randomness, the quench disorder in the system, it actually moves around. And give it enough time, it'll, inev it'll inevitably stumble out of that zone. And when that happens, it will no longer self-organize and adapt. It'll collapse. So it's a very thin boundary. Yes. Between the total uh, randomness, which will be disruptive, and, 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 and a static condition, which can never adapt. Our life, our lives are on the edge. <laughs> and eventually, we will all have a mass extinction event. This has implications for how we understand some diseases. We know that liver pathology, 100 people get hepatitis A, one person will need a liver transplant or they'll die. Is it something special about their virus or is it something special about their immune system? Or is it simply that with 100 people, the mathematical probability is that one person will die and it's not something specific about them. It may simply be, mm how livers self-organize mm. and how a virus disrupts that self-organization. Um, so, so in your work, what are the key criteria that define self-organization? You, you need a certain, num certain amount of numbers. Yes. Uh, you need, uh, uh, you, you need uh, something that is random in the system, but not too much. Right. What else? Um, no member of the system can be monitoring the whole thing. Now, we may think we are you know, economists. Mm. They think they're monitoring the whole system, but they're part of the system. They're not actually outside of it. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't a role for leadership. Uh, the Beatles are a good example of this. If you believe that the Beatles are one of the great rock bands mm -hmm. ever, then you think they're responsible for Beatlemania. It's yeah. obvious. Right. 
If you listen to the Beatles talking about their creativity in the Beatles anthology, they're very clear that their creativity was driven by their fan base. It was the screaming girls that created Beatlemania. And they conditioned the need for adaptive responses from the Beatles, and then their fans would respond. So as, as Beatlemania started to explode, the Beatles were playing the same songs. They weren't doing anything differently. The crowds got bigger and bigger and louder and louder. So your claim is that Beatlemania and adult cell stem transplants in, in the liver are pretty much the same kind of self-organizing system. Sure. <laughs> As the fan base got bigger and bigger, and they started going on tour, it eventually got to the point where, they're very clear about this, Ringo is really annoyed when he describes it, they couldn't hear themselves play anymore. The screaming was so loud in stadiums that they actually couldn't hear their own music. So Ringo, all he could do was put down a really heavy beat that they could feel in the vibration of the stage. And they realized, we're not making music anymore. We don't want to do this. And so they thought, let's make some music that we can't take on tour. And they came up with um, Sgt. Pepper. Mm -hmm. The whole point of that was they couldn't take it to a stadium because the sounds and the music and the instruments couldn't be taken on tour. So that's what took them to the development of, this, of the studio album. It wasn't they were thinking, hmm, what can we do creatively next? Mm -hmm. It was, we don't want to go out on tour anymore. Same thing, they basically invented the music video, you can say. They made two films for Ed Sullivan to show because he wanted them on the show and they said, we're not traveling all because of the fans. So, uh, so yeah, there's a, obviously the Beatles' creativity then feeds back in, but they're part of the same process. And that process between them and their fans and how they interacted with each other and the fans interacted with each other and between those two groups, Beatlemania self-organizes out of that, unpredictably but very dynamically, and eventually led to a mass extinction event. <laughs> and the Beatles broke up.